Uh, I'm here, uh, my name's Travis Hill with Sojo, uh, and I'm here to give an update where exactly where we're at with uh, Android. And I titled this presentation, uh, Android Activation is kind of a hint to that we, uh, that we were going broader soon, and as Jeff announced in his keynote, uh, we'll be in uh, beta in R2. So what are we gonna talk about today? Uh, first of all, I'm going to give a general status update. And uh, then I'll give an update about uh, how things work uh, under the hood. This will be new for some of you, old hat for some of you, so stick with me. There are uh, some brand new things in this presentation as well. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the recently added incremental compilation functionality and how that works. And then uh, some big additions to Android declares uh, that are uh, in the product now and coming soon after XDC. And of course, everyone's favorite topic, uh, release plans. Uh, when are we going to roll this out? So over here on the right is a picture of our uh, little framework tester app. We have hundreds and hundreds of automated <laughs> tests. Uh, uh, all of these tests tend, uh, don't necessarily pass all the time, but almost uh, all of them do pass before a build goes out to you. Uh, it tests both the framework and compiler. We have both sets of tests in there, all kinds of different ways of using and exercising the language and casting this to that, uh, and calling the framework, going out online, doing things with local databases, just about everything under the sun. Uh, since the last XTC, which was, again, only seven months ago, we've doubled the number of tests that we uh, run daily uh, for Android. So uh, with UI controls, the controls, of course, uh, are all drag and drop. The control locking uh, and their position are changeable in code, just like the other platforms. And uh, we've added and fixed numerous methods and properties on these controls since the last XDC. And uh, this table lists some of the common framework classes that are available uh, to Android projects. Uh, and there are even more than are listed here. We have system device and version data. Uh, we have uh, URL base 64 hex encoding methods. Um, we've added and updated uh, even more of these since the last XDC. So, Simply put, the majority of the Zojo framework is now in and present in Android, and of course, there is more on the way after the initial release. And uh, we always are growing our set of examples uh, for Android. They cover a wide variety of framework functionality and application types to help people hit the ground running. And uh, as we go into our next phase of testing, which is testing as part of uh, the 2023 R2 cycle, all of these examples will be integrated directly into the project chooser, so they'll be very easy for you to grab and test and evaluate uh, during that phase. So what are we working on now? Well, it's going to sound similar if you were uh, at our last XDC or watched that video. Development is now focused on bug fixes, unsurprisingly, and uh, compilation optimization. So we've been working very, very hard to take care of bug reports as they come in. Uh, as you heard this morning, uh, we've tackled a majority of those, almost 1,000 from both internal and external sources. And so now we're getting to the point where uh, there are still some important bugs to fix, but many and many of them have been. And we're starting to do some compilation optimization now. Uh, the incremental compilation that I'll touch on uh, soon, as well as upfront, that kind of first phase of compilation is uh, going to get optimized before we ship. So building an app, bottom line, uh, even though Android as a platform is unique in several ways when you compare it against uh, the other ones we support, we want every Zoja developer to feel at home, just like building uh, for any of the other platforms, even though there are numerous differences under the hood. And to do that, Android uses control locking for the layout, allows you to change control position in code whenever you need that flexibility. 
So drag, drop, add code, just like you're used to in Zojo. Uh, and the very next session after this one is a hands-on walkthrough where Paul and I will take you uh, through building some Android apps and you can see exactly how it's done. So uh, under the hood, uh, we often get uh, these kind of under the hood questions. Uh, and while we consider a lot of what's going on behind the scenes as implementation details, uh, XDC is one of those places that we like to dig a bit deeper with you. Uh, now, if you uh, have uh, been to the last XDC or uh, you've watched this video, uh, you're familiar with this stuff, so uh, bear with me, but I know a lot of you aren't, so I, I wanted to cover it because it's, some, it's probably the number two thing I get asked after when will it ship is how does it work. <laughs> <laughs <laughs> so uh, with compilation debugging, uh, that part is completely new. We uh, have a trans compiler that takes your Zojo code transparently into Kotlin. We have a new debugging engine uh, that talks to those uh, virtualized apps in Android. And of course, the framework itself is brand new uh, and built in Kotlin. And while all of those things are big changes that have taken us a while to build, our overall goal is that you don't have to care about any of that. <laughs> and of course, we're shooting for very wide compatibility. Uh, our current device target is uh, Android 7 and above, uh, which as of now represents 94.4% of devices in use. Uh, just like any platform, there's always a balance to strike with the uh, supported versions, the effort required to maintain that support. Uh, and with Android hitting more than 90%, well, we're really happy where we are right now. Uh, I will note that uh, this minimum version requirement could change over time. Uh, but if it does, we're always watching that key percentage to make sure that we cover the vast majority of devices at any given time. So uh, with compilation, uh, when I tell people that we have this trans compiler that's going and translating from uh, Zojo code to Kotlin, well, why do you do that? Don't you have an ARM compiler? Well, yes, we have an ARM compiler that's used all over the place both 32-bit, 64-bit for Linux, iOS, macOS, and now Windows. And uh, so why do we do this? Well, uh, we have this ARM compiler, but as you, you may not know, as uh, part of Android, they actually run on many different instruction sets and uh, will run on some new ones in the future. It is not strictly just ARM and x86. So instead of uh, us outputting uh, native code, like native ARM code or native x86 code, Google recommends uh, that we do Java and Android bytecode. One of the reasons why is because uh, they are looking forward uh, to seeing, as has happened historically, that they need to support other chipsets as they come along. And uh, along with that bytecode, the recommended way to generate it is uh, via Kotlin. So uh, OS calls and controls live in the VM bytecode world. So this is what makes this decision really important for uh, those of us who use Zojo a lot because while you may be able to uh, get away with completely native code in something like a game where there's not a lot of OS controls, there's not a lot of buttons or radio buttons, et cetera, uh, in a typical Zojo app, you have a lot of text fields and things like that that uh, are provided by the OS. And those are all in the virtual bytecode world. So if we uh, did our same compilation approach that we do on the other platforms, you would actually have a speed hit because we would constantly be having to go over what they call the JNI bridge to interact with all these controls. So we want to live exactly where those controls live. And as I mentioned, this automatically allows for ARM 32 and 64-bit support, x86, 32, and 64. 
And uh, Risk 64, which is one that I, I'm not sure a lot of people have heard of, is a open, completely open and free architecture that people are now starting to build chips based on. And Google recently announced that, that they intend for Risk 64 to be a first class citizen on Android. So while we have no idea uh, how far that will go, what those devices might look like, if they'll really catch on, you don't have to worry about it because of the approach we took. Your apps, as they were already built, will just work. Uh, and again, uh, you just write your Zojo code one way, the way you're used to, and you are all set. Uh, there's no ABI changes to worry about. Uh, as you change different chipsets, the, the way that you interface with other binaries can change, but not uh, in this uh, bytecode world. And there are some significant kernel and runtime changes in Android's future. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Fuchsia OS project at Google, uh, but they're constantly evaluating some new approaches that uh, will change the foundation of Android quite a bit. And those will mostly uh, require some rebuilds for those uh, apps uh, that were done in native code. But if you follow Google's recommendations and you have built your app in Java Android bytecode, it still gets compiled natively on the device, but it will just work even if the lowest level uh, things change in the Android operating system in the future. And that's the bottom line, is once you've built your app here, even if it's uh, a year later and there's now a RISC-64 phone, your app is going to run and it's going to run at native speed and you didn't have to do a single thing, you didn't even have to rebuild. Uh, so with compilation, our initial release, as we have said, is focused on phones. Uh, phones are by far the most popular uh, Android device type, but they are most certainly not the only ones. Uh, Zojo built Android apps today can run on other devices, uh, including uh, tablets and laptops and Chromecasts and uh, retro gaming devices. Uh, Windows 11 now, with its subsystem for Android, I'm not sure how many of you have experimented with it, but uh, you actually install this by going to the Microsoft Store in Windows, and you search for, I believe it's the Amazon App Store. You download that, and what you're actually downloading besides the uh, App Store is an entire Android runtime. And once that's installed, you can actually run APKs, which are Android applications, uh, right inside of Windows. Uh, handheld gaming devices, which I mentioned, uh, and Fire OS, Kindle tablets and devices, because Fire OS is really just a variant of Android. So while I do want to be clear that our initial 1.0 release of Android is focused on phones, and we don't officially support these, I have actually taken our cats up example, and I have run them on every single one of those, and it works. So uh, even though we have a different output, which is this uh, Android Java bytecode, uh, why couldn't we just use L LLVM to do this? Because we use LLVM everywhere else. Well, the answer is that LLVM does not have a Android Java bytecode backend. Uh, but we want all of the code and platform advantages that I've talked about. We want that ability to build once, run native everywhere, and even if Google changes significant foundational things, your apps can still work. Uh, and I want to reiterate, this approach does produce native apps on devices. That's been a hallmark for Zojo and it continues to be with Android. Uh, don't get confused that because we output Android uh, Java bytecode, what happens is when you download that from the Play Store, it's either already compiled the native code for your device, depending on your configuration, or it gets compiled on the device the first time you run it. Uh, so you're always running native code at the end of the day. There should be no confusion about that. Okay, so with this transpiler approach, 
we needed a way to make uh, debugging work just like it does on other platforms, uh, even though it is completely different behind the scenes. Uh, if you want to talk to Paul, Paul has had a fun journey in building this bridge, trying to bridge the gap between two very different approaches. Uh, but this bridge translates the Zojo IDE messages and the Android virtual debugging messages uh, so they match up. And it uh, allows your regular debugging experience in Zojo to work, both break, setting breakpoints, uh, removing them, viewing, uh, viewing the values of variables, et cetera. Uh, so this new compilation process uh, has certainly been a journey, and we are still uh, fixing some bugs here and there, uh, but we're working away at it, and uh, it's come a very, very long way, particularly in the time since the last XDC. So just before this XDC, we introduced in the test builds uh, incremental compilation. Uh, incremental compilation is something that our other platforms have had for a while, but it's brand new to Android. Uh, this means that after you've had a successful run uh, and we've compiled your whole project, there were no errors uh, and it runs, only the project items that are changed after that point uh, are recompiled. This can make a big difference uh, in the speed and how long you have to wait after you make a little tiny change in one particular code item and then hit run again. Now you'll see uh, that those things happen uh, much, much faster. And again, like other platforms, if you build instead of run, that will rebuild uh, everything uh, in your project all the time. And so, uh, what does this mean in a real world sense? Well, I have a little chart here. Uh, this is the, our, our classic Eddie's example and our Android test suite. And after they've been run successfully, this is how many seconds it takes to run it again. So before incremental compilation, you can see Eddie's took about 10 seconds, the uh, Android test suite took about 22, and they both take about three or four seconds now. So it's a huge, huge improvement. Uh, the larger project you have, typically uh, the bigger the benefit that you'll see. Uh, and as you can see here, overall, we're seeing improvements in second run time between 80 and 90%. So it's uh, pretty nice. Uh, and most of the time now, after your first run, is actually spent literally just copying and launching the app in the emulator on the device. It's uh, almost... Uh, almost instant uh, when you're just making tiny little uh, changes and tweaks between runs now. So now I wanna talk a bit about declares. Uh, declares are important because they let you access things uh, that aren't part of the included Zojo framework if you need to. So I have broken this down into three types for Android declares. There are simple declares uh, these have been around almost since the beginning of uh, Android support. Uh, you call a method in the Android namespace with some parameters, maybe get a value back, maybe don't. Those have been around for a while. We have two new types that we're introducing now for Android. And that first one is uh, object-based declare. So an object-based declare is a new way in Zojo to call uh, an OS or an OS provided method that lives on a given object. Uh, probably the biggest reason you would want to use this is if you have an instance of an interface control and you want to do something that's outside of the Zojo framework uh, to that control, like change its style, change its color, uh, do something uh, that you've read in the Android documentation that you want to do. Well, this allows that to happen. And then third are external libraries. Uh, external libraries are a bit special uh, in Android because they're typically managed online for a couple of reasons. One is that they can uh, update themselves. The other reason is that that gives us built-in uh, dependency management. So one external library, even Google's own uh, libraries like Google Play or Google barcode scanning often depend on other libraries. Well, 
With this approach that they have, you don't really need to think or worry about those dependencies. You declare what library you want to use, and it will pull down any other libraries that that library itself depends on. So what does a simple declare look like? Uh, if you've played around uh, with Android a lot, uh, you've already seen this. But for those who haven't, uh, the classic simple declare example is to get the current version of the operating system that we're running on. Uh, now, of course, this is actually provided to you in the Zojo framework, but it makes for an easy to understand example. So I want to get Android OS build version release, and I want to get it back as a string. So I've looked up that call in uh, the Android developer documentation. Uh, I tell it what I want it to be in Zojo first, which is Android version. The library or location uh, of the call, which in this case, again, is android.os.build.version. And then uh, the call I'm making, which in this case is release and the return type, uh, if there is any. There doesn't have to be a return type, but in this case, it's a string. And that gives us, whoa. Sorry. Uh, that gives us, as you can see on the right, Android version uh, 11. And it should be noted that this particular call uh, should only be used uh, to display an Android version. You don't want to do any math or anything on it because they can actually change the format of that string at any time. Now, object declares. This is something uh, brand new uh, that will be in your hands shortly. So object declares make it very easy to call something uh, that's, well, on an object. So one of the most common declare requests we've gotten since we started testing on Android is uh, I want a declare that changes something on a control or about a control. So we've been working on a really easy way to do this. Um, well, as easy as declares can be, you still have to jump over to the Android documentation and find out what you want. But once you know that and you know what you're trying to do, we think we've made this uh, pretty easy. So I'm going to take you through a couple of examples now that I think are fairly easy to understand uh, with this new uh, declare type. One is setting a mobile text field so it will auto-capitalize each uh, word. By default, we don't do that because we don't do that for other uh, Zojo platforms. But if you wanted that, that's an attribute you can set at the Android level. Uh, and the other uh, is just changing the background color of a uh, mobile button itself. So that's not something that we provide currently today in the Android framework, but if you wanted to do it, it's easy to make a declare to do so. So first, with the uh, mobile text field that I talked about, uh, this is a text view control in Android. Uh, and we will uh, have a list uh, at some point before we ship, so you will know what Android controls make up the uh, Zojo controls you see, for those of you who are interested in doing declares. And since we've looked this up, we know that it's a text view control, and we know we want to call a set input type. So this is an Android SDK call that we want to make on the actual uh, control of mobile text field. So since we want it to stay a regular text input field and automatically capitalize words, we've looked up these two constants in the Android developer docs. So it's uh, still type of text, and we want to uh, capitalize the words. So our ending value is going to be uh, 8193 that we want to call set input type with. So let's go ahead and see what an object declare for this would look like. Uh, they are similar to any other declare, except the lib part tells uh, Zojo information about the object that you want to call this on. So this is a object that exists uh, in the current context of the declare. So I'm saying uh, this object is my mobile text field. It's a Zojo control and what type it is. It's a mobile text field. 
and uh, the uh, parameter that uh, I want to pass. So we're calling set input type as it shows declare sub input type at the top on an in scope object which is named my mobile text field and it has a Zojo type of mobile text field and it just has the one integer parameter of what type we want to set that text field to be. Uh, so next talking about mobile button, uh, this is a material button control in Android. So we pull up the material button docs and we find out that the call is unsurprisingly set background color for a material button. And we've looked up uh, what the blue constant is and we have that value for our Zojo code. And let's take a look at what this declare would look like. So we have declare sub set background color on the object my mobile button of mobile button type and the parameter is the color that we want to set it to. Uh, again, one important note with these object declares, these, are, these only work with in-scope objects. So you need to place your declare uh, where the object is in scope, and I'll show you this in context in just a bit. Okay, so taking you through uh, how this actually works, uh, I recorded a short little video here. Uh, we've got a mobile text field at the top, and then we've got a uh, button right below that says uh, cap words for capitalized words. And then we've got another button that says uh, set back color for set the background color. And if we go look here, uh, that's really simple. Text field one dot capitalize each word. That's what we're gonna call in the first button. And the second button, we're going to call me dot set background color and the constant value of blue. And so now I'm actually going to go in here. I've got a module with some extension methods. So that's how I'm able to call them uh, earlier is I just uh, have extended mobile text field and I'm going to set its input type. And there's another extension method, but this one is on mobile button. And I'm going to pass in my color and then call set background color. And I have a comment there, both for my benefit and everyone's benefit of where in the Android documentation you're able to find this information. So I click run, start typing, and it's just a regular field right now, but I click the uh, cap words to call that declare, and then I just keep typing as normal, and you can see every word is now auto-capitalized. And I click the second button that says set back color, and hey, instantly its color changed from green to blue with that declare. So uh, external libraries. As I mentioned before, uh, when someone wants to use an external library in the world of Android, they typically reference a library name uh, and a version uh, if they don't want the latest and it's retrieved online. If you leave off the version, it will always just grab the latest. Uh, also, as mentioned before, uh, doing it this way, all your dependencies are automatically resolved uh, on any particular library. And again, we've been working on making this very easy in Zojo. We've seen how it works on other things, including Android Studio, and we want to make it just very, very simple for you, the Zojo user. So we're taking away a lot of the pain. So uh, what might you use these external library declares for? Well, there's a lot of things that work this way. Uh, two things are uh, if you want to use Google's library for uh, code scanning, and by code scanning I mean like a QR code or a barcode, uh, there's, I think it supports 14 different types of codes that you can scan through the camera. Uh, or if you want to do Play Store billing, this is another that I've been asked about, you know, I want to set up a subscription or I want to validate that this person has paid. Well, those are technically in external libraries that are provided by Google. So uh, this type of library dependency and declares uh, aren't quite finished yet, but the core pieces are working under the hood. 
So uh, let's walk through and see what a simple uh, barcode and QR code scanner might look like using these types of declares. So first of all, in the IDE, there will be a new place uh, that you can uh, manage these kinds of dependencies. So I've looked up uh, on Google, I want the Google code scanner. What's that library name? Well, it's com, Google, Android, uh, GMS, Play Services Code Scanner 16. That's what I want. So in the documentation uh, for these external Google libraries and uh, libraries provided by other vendors, by the way, uh, you will see this full name, and if a particular version is recommended, it will include the version after the colon. You just copy that, paste it into uh, your project as a dependency, and we'll take care of the rest. And when that library is now available to your project, you can declare into it to add those required calls to Zojo itself. So to do this uh, barcode scanning, the first thing you need to do is actually uh, get the client. So this is what a declare for that would look like. Declare the function, get client lib in GMS barcode scanning, which we've brought into our project there. And then we use uh, an object declare that we just talked about earlier uh, to hook up our success listener. That's uh, the method that's going to get called uh, when we've actually detected a code as the user has moved around the camera. So it's an object called my scanner of type object, and my callback is just a delegate, uh, and that delegate type is scanner callback. And then the final declare that we make into that library is called start scan on my scanner. And uh, once you call it, you, uh, when you want to call it, you do that by uh, declaring a variable. In this case, my scanner is my scanner object. My scanner equals get client that we've made the declare for. My scanner add on success listener got barcode. Got barcode is a delegate method that we talked about earlier. So that's what gets called when it's actually detected a code. And then we actually activate the scan by calling myscanner.startscan. And in this case, uh, when you call that method, this is what you see in your app. <laughs> oh, geez. Sorry about that. Uh, and doing it this way through Google's library is actually quite convenient because it requires no special permissions to your app. You don't have to worry about asking for permission to the camera or anything else. And you, I'm not sure if you can read, but at the bottom it says scanned by Google on behalf of barcode scanner. And barcode scanner was just the name of my simple app that I did to demonstrate this. Uh, and as I mentioned, it is Google Play that is accessing the camera. If I do this with no permission of the camera, it still works. I don't have to ask the user for it because it is Google that's doing it. And the only thing that we get access to is the actual data encoded uh, in the QR code or barcode. So to summarize the declare functionality in Android, uh, the simple declares are available to test right now in the current build. The object declares uh, are, uh, have now been uh, checked in just before the conference, so they'll be able to uh, be tested very soon after XDC. And the external libraries uh, are still under development, but they will be available in version one, I can happily say, and thus available before we ship. So release plans. Uh, we are now feature complete for the initial release of Android. Uh, there may be a few exceptions here and there, uh, like the declare functionality that we've talked about today, uh, and likely some framework tweaks here and there. Uh, but for the most part, the UI controls and framework surfaces they exist today are what will ship as Android 1. Uh, not only have we had some test apps in the Google Play Store, but some of our testers have too, and of course that in includes the uh, XDC app that's available on the Play Store. Uh, I've actually been pleasantly surprised with how many people have taken their uh, apps in our very early uh, testing of Android. Some people have 
not only just hit the Google Play Store, but I know of at least one that has uh, hit uh, the Amazon Store, Microsoft Store, and Play Store all together with the same Android app. Uh, there is, I almost feel this is understating it, there is high demand for this. <laughs> uh, and so uh, even though it doesn't have every feature of every other platform, uh, as it solidifies and has already been uh, proven very useful, uh, we want to get it out to a wider audience because there is uh, such demand out there. And of course, there is much more to come after the initial release. So I was just recently asked again about plugin support for Android. And uh, while there still isn't support for traditional Zojo plugins in V1 of the Android release, uh, there are support for declares. Uh, and with the new external library declare option, if someone were to put a library on the central repository, a Zojo user can easily grab that using the external declare library. So while there are no uh, Zojo plugins as they're classically known in Android, you could put something on the repository, include the relevant Zojo declares to that library, and basically have the equivalent of a Zojo plugin. Uh, as always, we have detailed items that goes into what is and is not supported uh, in the tester notes. And those are available in the forum just where you grab the download. And when, 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 when? <laughs> so uh, we can't give you a specific date, but uh, as Jeff mentioned, we are very happy to tell you that 2023 R2 is the target. Uh, we can't give you a specific date because that's inherently uh, unpredictable. Uh, we intend to start uh, Android as part of the 2023 R2 testing uh, soon. There are still some uh, what I would deem critical compilation bugs to fix before it goes to that wider testing. Uh, but also, as we've uh, discussed, the number of those is starting to dwindle, which is great. Uh, so there are still transpiler framework uh, debugging bugs to fix uh, before uh, that testing begins. Uh, and before we ship, this isn't before we start testing 2023 R2, but before we ship, we're going to work on improving the compilation times. We're going to update the documentation. Now, someone had asked me actually just yesterday uh, about how we're going to handle that with Android. Well, in many cases, the usage of uh, something like a button, et cetera, is exactly what you're used to. And there's not gonna be that much difference, but we are going to tag the documentation throughout to tell you what is and isn't available on each platform as we do today. It's just now that will include notes for Android. Uh, and finally, we're still working uh, on all of the examples to get them fixed up and ready to go, because that's one of the quickest ways to learn anything is to grab all the examples and run through them and see how they work and kick the tires. Uh, also, as mentioned this morning, uh, the initial release will be tagged as beta. And uh, why do we do that? Well, it's because everything is brand new in this uh, from top to bottom. It's a new compilation engine, new debugging engine, uh, completely uh, written from the ground up framework uh, for this new platform. Uh, and so if you've been uh, with us at Zojo for a while, you know it's an approach we've used before uh, with Coco, for example. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, already today, even before uh, we're in wider testing, you can build a lot of different apps and even go to the Play Store with them right now. Uh, and really, the term beta is just a heads up to expect some bumps in the road. Um, we intend to fix those bumps as we encounter them, but we just want to be upfront that this is a brand new thing with so much code in it uh, that we uh, want people to uh, expect those things, but we'll work with all of you uh, to get your projects up and running. 
So uh, in summary, for release plans, uh, we're working very hard to deliver Android support. It's been a top focus for us for a while now. Uh, I think Paul and I are very excited <laughs> to uh, get this out into the next phase. Um, not to mention uh, all of Zojo. I mean, I think we might even probably throw a little virtual party as <laughs> Android goes out the door. And a very big thank you to all who have been testing. You know, when uh, Jeff quoted that number of basically a thousand issues, a lot of those uh, came from you guys. And we just really appreciate you helping uh, get this product mature and ready to go. And uh, as we mentioned, uh, together we've worked back and forth and we've resolved hundreds of issues to get it to where it is now and where it's going to be in the future. Uh, we know how excited people are for the release, uh, and uh, it's getting closer and closer every day. OK, I've tried to leave time for questions. So here we go. Please don't throw tomatoes. Uh, yes? OK, so the question is, uh, can I uh, ask uh, the device to, say, take a picture or interact with other devices? Uh, there aren't a lot of external device things built into the framework today. But for taking a picture, for example, that's actually an example I'm working on right now. It's a declare example, but that will be available to everyone for how to do that on day one. Uh, yes? So the question is, uh, can we use these new declares uh, to get Bluetooth support? And uh, the answer is a qualified yes. Bluetooth itself has a huge surface of many different methods from connecting to communicating, et cetera. But if it is a um, standard Bluetooth device uh, that is typically understood without ex extra drivers, then yes, you should be able to declare and interact with it. It's something that I've started to play with. Uh, but it, I think it gets a bit complex if your device requires special drivers. But I've also found if your Bluetooth device requires special drivers, typically they will also provide a library for use from Android. In that case, you use this functionality to call that library instead. Uh, yeah. yeah. I have two questions. Okay. OK, so the first question was uh, kind of device versus simulator. I showed the Android emulator here, and we'll be uh, working with that in the next session, uh, versus real device. Uh, I myself typically use the emulator a lot. I'm on Apple Silicon, which is also ARM, and their images work really quite well with that. But if you're on Intel, I think Paul would say the experience is, what, five times better? just going to a device uh, directly uh, and testing there. I mean, before I've put anything out, I always test on both, to be honest. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that the emulator you're showing is the emulator in Android Studio. It's not anything that comes from Zojo. Yeah, and I, I'm going to repeat that just for the recording. The emulator that we show is Google's Android emulator. It's not from Zojo. Yeah. Ah, so the question was, will there be a separate Zojo installation still like we have been doing for Android? Uh, there may be, and I, I don't think we've decided yet, there may be a couple more builds that are separate. But it is becoming part of the 2023 R2 release and will be tested at that point exclusively from that same build of 2023 R2 in the testing cycle. 
Okay, uh, any others? Uh, then thank you very much.